Alright, so um, this thing is beyond here. Um, we want to wrestle with things. First one. Okay, all right. Uh, so, just a little fun thing to start with. So, this is from, I want to put you to this other side, uh, visual complexity, which is still going, it's been around for a while. This is, okay, so this is, this is uh, the response to uh, a request to serve a one HTML page with an image. And one response, and so it's a dynamical network here, right? So it's a bunch of uh, uh, system calls. So one of these is done by a Windows um, server, and the other one is done by Linux. Point out the wrong way. The point was to guess. Right? You should be able to guess. It's from 2006. Um, so I don't know if it's better now. But, you know, obviously, this is Linux, right? So, uh, so that's just to do one thing. That's a, that's a nasty network. And so this is a, there's a whole enterprise with software to figure out. You know, if you can get this picture out, then you just have to look at this and say, not so good guys, right? Um, but you can imagine a much, much, this is just to do this tiny thing. So what if you have something, you, know, you have your, your website running for a whole day and your website is Twitter, right? That's, that's a big thing. So, or Google or something. So how do you figure out if it's behaving the right way, especially when things are being clutched together? So very difficult problems, very different kinds of problems. Okay, so that's just for fun. I want to show you this is maybe a little too meta and something might explode, but this is, I've tried to improve these, um, Thing. So now the, now the slides have been captured, right? So it should be a cleaner experience if you will. <laughs> Waste another hour and a quarter of your life. You can, um, you can come back to them. Anyway, just trying to make a nicer product for you guys. So uh, uh, that's good. And what else is here? Oh, yeah, so that work, that right to the work, uh, Lewis's work about cities and happiness and the stuff I mentioned the other day is, was on the Today Show apparently this morning. And Gail, Oprah's friend, mentioned it yesterday. So, um, on TV. So I think we're done. I think we're totally done. Um, Lewis might explode, but that will be fun to watch. We'll save him just before he explodes. Okay. So, uh, yeah. One more came back. Part of truth was pretty happy. Okay. Whoever that individual or group of individuals, that shadowy group is. Uh, so. That will come back more regularly now that part of truth exists. Uh, what else do we have? Okay, so I'll keep improving these slides, which is just my crazy thing to do. Oh yeah, so this just appeared in the New York Times. So this is a yeah a little thing. So the whole movie business, right? This is a nice little visualization, but you can run around and see. So this is for the Oscars. You can see who's connected to whom, right? What they were nominated for in in, in the past, what they've worked together on. So this is Spielberg. So you get to, there's a check here for Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan. I don't know why Indiana Jones didn't get one, but there you go. So, um, so yeah, you know, with these funny little networks, it's good to play around with these things. So that's, that's a nicely done little visualization. It's a small network. Of course, they're much bigger, but for some reason, uh, Denzel Washington is out by himself just this year, right? So they called that the island. There's Naomi Watts as the impossible. Um, this one, it's, this one, it's nicely done. So this is for, so this is uh, Les Miserables, or in Australia, as you would say, Les Miserables. <laughs> Les Mis, you don't say Les Mis. It's, it's true, um, you would say that. Uh, let's see, Zero Dark Thirty is up here, and you have all the connections to crazy people. I, I can't get it to come across. 
Um, yeah, Argo, which uh, is the exception that proves the rule regarding Ben Affleck. It's usually terrible films. Um, after Good Will Hunting, it was always my go-to for, uh, for deceptive advertising. Anyway, ah, that's a fun thing to play around with. So let's see. So I've tried to improve these. This is a better, yeah. Is it a better slide? It's a better slide. There's a better connection for you if you want to look at it later on. But that's a, that's that's all of science in some vision of it. We went through this stuff, and we're up to talking about um, properties of complex networks. So today, that's what we're going to talk about: properties of complex networks. And if we get into it, the next thing will be um, small world networks. So this is something. Uh, that's very meta and ridiculous for me, and I know uh, have a lot of experience with the small world story. So I'll tell you about some of the history there and um, how it all kind of fits together in a strange way. All right. So, but it has a very nice. Uh, you know, again, it's one of those things that has uh, many iterations. It's still going um, in a way, but uh, yeah, experiments, theory, uh, kind of, uh, design problems, all sorts of things. All right, so, so this was this observation I, went, I made at the end of the last uh, lecture, which is that networks are usually a mess. If someone makes a nice network, you know, puts a beautiful visualization in front of you, either it's a small network or they've done something very naughty to it to make it you know, renderable in, in two dimensions. Right? These are incredibly high dimensional spaces that they could actually really fit into in some real sense. And something that, that is useful to think about is the degree of a node, right? The average number of friends of a node, if you think about it in a social way, is, is kind of like the local dimension, right? So it's sort of like a local dimension. So the networks are these very mixed dimensional spaces. And so we'll come to that again, potentially, but that's a way to think about them. All right, so all of these pieces, I just want to talk about them. Some I'll expand on a little more than others, and then we'll get on the small world. So degree distribution, is the, is the big deal, right? So there's a list of things here, and I've kind of noted that. It took a long time for people to figure this out. So um, the main work that comes, there's two works I told you about. Small world networks, that's 98. Scale for networks, which is about degree distributions, is 99. And I just, no one had really picked this up. It just, it doesn't really appear in, in math beforehand. Uh, and there's some mathematics of these networks. And in fact, there's a story, Baravazi is the person behind an, an album, Breaker album, but Baravazi is the character behind the scale for networks, and which, as I said, all connects back to Simon's model and all of this stuff, we'll see that. Uh, told me, actually, at some point how, I can't remember who this was, but it was a famous uh, Hungarian mathematician or Romanian mathematician who had worked on random networks with these weird de degree distributions, right? These parallel size distributions that we talked about. And they have all these interesting properties, but decided eventually, well, they're pathological. Because this is not, these are very rare and weird things. So there's lots of fun things you get out of it. You know, for instance, diseases spread really quickly on these networks, etc. But um, you know, he was just playing around with it. But it seemed to him to be just goofing on. Anyway, that turns out to be what most real networks are like. <laughs> so, um, so, all right. You have to think about how they become that way. All right, so it is the elephant in the room. So let's talk about it first, and we'll come back. So a uh, piece of cake, right? Probably, and you've seen this in different ways with some of the stuff we've done already. That uh, life is um, So the way we're going to think about it, uh, it's probably that you select um, you select a node at random from your network. So you just go in and randomly pick out a node, and you look at this. So it's probably that that node has to be and we'll come to this later on for contagion, but it's, a, it's just a nice thing to think about right now that, uh, so this guy has degree 5, right, so you select that guy has degree 5. However, um, if you select by edges, so say you jump in and you randomly select an edge, right, so the different things, so you jump on an edge and then you run off on one direction, the node that you end up with the probably that it has a degree k is not a piece of k. So there's something to think about. I won't tell you what it is. You can think about it, but it's not. It's tempting to think it should be. And you can. There's actually some calculations you do for pure random networks where if you make that mistake, then you get the correct answer for, for um, 
it doesn't matter, you get the correct answer for, uh, for the same contagion type processes. Okay. So, is that actually kind of a disaster because you'll see this in some works where you just make a completely huge mistake, go through all these calculations and get the right answer, and then just say along the track. Um, but that was, okay, so there's something different about that, so you might want to think about that. Right, so we, okay, there's no degree just to have it there. Uh, so, so called Erdish Ren. So, Erdish and Ren are sort of the characters that are linked most to these random networks. Many, many, many people have worked on them, but they get the, the tag. So, um, we're really bringing them into, into a field of, as a field of study. So, this is, uh, this is what you get for these kinds of random networks. So, let me describe them. Uh, first of all, the degree distribution is this, it's Poisson degree distribution. So this, this little guy in angle brackets is the average degree. So there's some average degree, some characteristic degree, which we know is very different to um, the case where we have these parallel size distributions. So there's a characteristic degree. So this is just some quantity at the front, uh, there's a, there's a uh, factorial on the bottom. And this, uh, so this, this is growing very large, and you know all about it from Stirling's approximation. Uh, this is a polynomial, so this thing is increasing depending on the average degree. But typically it's greater than one, so it's, it's growing. Alright, but Poissons have this nice benign looking shape to them. Right? And they're functions of, the discrete, so it's a function of, right, this is 0, 1, 2, out here. So, it's a good thing to think about why that comes about. So what are these, what are these random networks that we're talking about? So these are, so, I have in this slot. So, so basically you take a box of all networks that have M edges and N nodes, take all of those possible networks and you just pull one out. And that's that's one of these edge running networks, right? So these are labeled, they have nodes one, two, three, four, five. They're labeled, and you think about every possible way you could add M edges to these N nodes. You make all of those networks. You put them in this, stuff them into this box, and pull one out of random. You'll never really, if it's a big enough box, it's a big M and N are big enough, you will never pull out one of these ones that has this parallel size distribution. You just never find them, right? You rummage around, you just never get one. You will almost always, but there's one in there, right? There's, there, there, I mean, there are a bunch of them. There are some in there where there's one guy that has tons of friends, right? It's really obviously weird look if you put on a plot. That's in there, it has to be in there. Maybe these guys have a few extra friends like this. That's going to be in there, but it's very hard to find. It's a very low entropy structure. So most of the ones you pull out, will, and if it's big, and then they all look basically the same. They'll all have these Poisson distributions. So we have to think about why they do. So that's some good, uh, good stuff to work with. Now, the bonus is that you never really find these in the real world, right? Okay. But what you do find, what you can work with then is say, all right, pass on, good. Let me choose a particular degree distribution, maybe one I've observed for a real network. So you choose one, that you, you actually take one that's observed for a real network. And then you randomize it other ones. We'll come to that later on. So you can build a whole bunch of other networks, for example, that have the same degree distribution as the real one, because we're taking that as the big story of a network. We randomize it, we make 10,000 other networks that all have the same, exact same degree distribution. Right? So node 7 has three friends in all of these networks, but otherwise it's just been randomly, randomly rewired, right? Just kind of messed it up. And then we look to see what else, what other structure is in the real network versus all of these other made-up ones. Come to that. So there's real use in these things. There's real use in, in uh, getting an understanding for when things can spread and so on and these kinds of things. So it's all good, but you never find any in the real world. Not that I know about. Alright, so scale free network. So these are two big stories that I want to give you straight away. So uh, the word is hubs, which is a little bit misleading in some ways. Uh, in some ways, it's a scale free thing. Because scale free, it feels like a physical thing. But as we know now, this is about these, what, what's really being referred to as this parallel size distribution. Right? And so there's, there's no characteristic scale inside this. There's a minimum scale, which will be k equals 1. Right, we ignore the guys that are not involved, and then some maximum degree, but inside that there's no characteristic scale. But it gives rise to this idea of hubs, that there are some big, right, you're selecting from this distribution repeatedly, 
you've seen this sort of thing already, right? So if it's earthquakes, now and then you get a big one, and then if you sample for 10 times as long, you get an even bigger one, and so on. So that's the kind of network we'll get through there. I'll have some images later on. But it means there are these hubs, right? So there's some, it's actually not a very good representation of a true social network if you limit the links to being real friends, right? Really strong friends, whatever that means. Um, you know, no one has 10,000 friends. You can have 10,000 followers on Facebook, but they're not buddies, right? So, um, uh, so, but but in many many of these the, you know networks um, that we see that where there's less uh, constraint on, on having more links, then you can get these skews. And so you you might have someone. So think of say the web, right? So you have Google, tons of sites pointing to Google in some way or another. Tons of sites pointing to New New York Times or whatever it is to Amazon. Um, and so they have what you, you, you might call hubs, and of course now Wikipedia is a great example as well. Lots of points into the Wikipedia, which itself points out. Alright, so I, I tangentially mentioned this, so link cost control the skew of this distribution. So if it's costly to have links, right, so it's costly to have best friends forever, right, it's, it's hard to have, my youngest daughter has 10 best friends. <laughs> She'll list her best friends. Um, I guess it's the bestest. Uh, well, that fluctuates greatly. Um, let's see. So, uh, yeah. So you, you know, there's a limit to how many really good close friends you have, right? For example, uh, and that's been brought out in some studies of Facebook, where there's sort of you, know, you might find four or five or six people that people really communicate with in a really strong way. Right? They, they have 150, 200, 300, 400 friends, but then there's this really close call. Alright, so the cost of the links controls how far out this can go. So if you're on the web, sure, you can get up and you just put more links up, right? It does, there is, a, there is a, a cost of entry. So Google, everyone starts pointing to Google early on, and Google just turns into this thing that builds, part of its job is to build farms of computers, right? And people with jobs of unpacking computers. So the fact that we link to it has a real, you know, electrons are being destroyed somewhere. It's not, it's not completely you know, off in our heads. It's a, it's a, it's a real expensive. All right. <clears throat> Interesting problem we'll come to later on. You think, all right, so hubs will help spread things. So if you think about a disease spreading around through uh, airports, so people flying and so on, and, you know, when someone sneezes on someone and, and then they go off and all their airplanes and it can spread, um, that's, that's, that suggests, right, that Yes, in general, this will help things spread. And for certain kinds of contagion, kind of natural ones, the ones that we think about, yes. But um, there are social kinds of contagion that, in fact, that, that this hubs will stop. Right. So we'll get to that. That's an interesting kind of opposite story. <coughs> All right. Contagion, very big deal. Let's see. So, um, as I said, so these things are a mathematical construct, very interesting. Lots of things you can do. Uh, as we've uh, talked about with the Simon model, and we'll show you how this fits back in with, uh, with this network story here. So they're growing networks, and, they, and so networks have to come from something, right? These ones just come from the brain, which is, I made it. Um, which is a little nuts, right? So they have to grow, I mean, neural networks, they have to grow, so there's some ontogeny that matters that you have to figure out how that's affected the resulting form. And there's a plausible, measurable, uh, mechanism behind it. So, you know, fair amount of debate about it, but we'll get to that. Um, so randomness is out there for sure. It's a huge, we've talked about this, but it's not complete, complete and utter um, nihilistic randomness that we're talking about. All right. You should be in some German philosophy class, I guess, if that's what you want. Um, <coughs> All right. So that's the big, that's the big, that's the elephant in the room, all right? That's sitting on top of you. That you didn't notice until recently. Um, and you're like, wow, there isn't an elephant. So social networks, uh, let's talk about uh, this idea of homophily, right? So birds of a feather flock together. That's, that's really the story. Is. And so assortativity is a similar thing. Um, so sociologists have had this term for a long time. Um, 
It's, very, it's a hard thing to actually measure, right? It's a very hard thing to measure. So do people uh, come together and become friends because they're similar already? Or is that screen? Or or they or they spread as a lost time. So is that there, or is there, or they um, you know they become friends for maybe a few reasons and then they start to copy each other and copy each other and everything's spreading that way. It's really hard to back out of data. Um, it's incredibly important for thinking about how uh, health behavior spreads and so on. And, I don't know, everything, economics, all sorts of behaviors. Um, of what's going on? Are people finding people that are similar to them and, and mixing in that way, um, or are they spreading things between each other? So uh, this is something that. Uh, so this is a little math, physics stuff that's been fun to work with. Uh, so degree is a good, good thing to think about for a sort of tipping. So do, so do people have lots of friends hang out with people with lots of friends? Or um, if it's a food network, do, uh, do organisms that eat lots of other organisms, do they, do, are they you know, the ones that they're connected to and that they eat them, get eaten by them, do they also have uh, lots of links as well? Um, and so we'll talk about, so from a degree point of view, which has all sorts of you know, great properties you can call them, how you can make networks that have, Strong degree, degree correlations, and so on. Or any, you know, we've done this, it's great fun. So, we're talking about the word assortativity. So, they're assortative in this case, just to use degree, if the, the, the degrees are similar to each other. Right? So, you just correlate. But of course, it could be age, it could be uh, the amount of fur on the animal, whatever it is. There's all sorts of other things. You can make many, right? So, for assortativity. Uh, and we're talking about disassortativity when, uh, it's in the case of degree, that we have high degrees connecting to low degrees. And so typically, and this is Mark Newman's uh, observation, uh, we could probably update this. Uh, so, so also social ones, so things like uh, directors of, of uh, boards of directors, uh, co-authors in, in uh, publications, actors. That, that seems to be a sort of thing, right? So social, roughly, roughly. Not completely, but generally. And then technological and biological, I mentioned food webs, tend to have this unevenness, right? So high degree nodes. Generally speaking, are connected to lower degree ones and so on. Right. Um, yeah, it's not completely one way or the other. These are just optimal. All right. So that's an important feature. So this, these are. So you have your degree distribution. You get that out. You say, okay, it's this kind of network, and then you look at something like a sortativity on top of it. Right. And it can really affect the behavior for sure. Absolutely. But the first thing you figure out is the degree. All right. So clustering. So um, this became a huge deal with the small world network story. So it's uh, I'll talk about that more, so I shouldn't go too much into it. But it's, it's Duncan Watson, Steve Strogatz's work. Um, they wanted to measure the socialness of networks, right? and they're looking at all sorts of networks. Neural network of C elegance. Well, what's a what's an so random pure random networks are absolutely not social in the sense that none of your friends know each other. Not a good problem. Right, so in a purely random network, I'm just going to say this and we're going to later. Um, you need to think of me. Okay, so locally in pure random networks, if they're very big, then you see this, right? So locally, they, if you go to some node, they're branching networks, actually, which is an old friend of mine. Uh, so you don't see this. This is not in here. So your friends know, know each other. So that's you know, as a first pass, just not true of social media. So, this is an example, right? So, there's A in the middle, and these guys have friends. Um, they're, they're friends with each other. And so, we can try to measure this. So, how do you measure this, right? So, we want to get out some sort of a clustering measure should be zero in this case. And it should be one, or one is a, it's good to go between zero and one, you can kind of handle that. Uh, it should be one if all of your friends know each other. Right? So say there's this guy with four friends, and all of those guys, it's fully connected. Right? So we, we want that case to be a one, this one to be a zero. So, a couple of uh, measures that people came up with. The original one is Watson Strogatz, this is the Nature paper, um, and I'll explain it in the coming slides, so we'll call it C1. So that's a, this is a, an average of a local property. Uh, so we'll explain it. 
And Newman uh, came up with a, so it's Mark Newman, who's a Michigan, a similar, uh, in many ways, a, a, analytically just easier thing to work with, entirely sensible piece. Uh, it gives you, uh, it gives you, if you like, if you just choose, so if you just choose one person who has two friends, wow, uh, the twist of lemming, um, What's the probability that your two friends have a connection? That is a very old multi party um, So, um, very obscure. Right. Okay, so, uh, yes, we'll get to that. Alright, so let's talk about it. These things that you cannot read. Uh, so, let's take this network, which is four friends, four, four people. A knows B, B and C and B are all good friends. Um, so how do we calculate C1? So this is this is what it is. So it's the average. So you average. So you go to every node and you compute the fraction of uh, possible friends, possible um, pairs of your friends that are in fact paired friends. So you have a node. You have let's say let's take me have three friends in the world. Right? So I have three friends, and then I look at if the how many of those. So there are six. Or there are um, Three choose two, three possible pairings of those friends, and I count up how many are actually friends. So say one of the, that pair is uh, um, are friends with each other, and the other they don't know each other, the others. Then so it's what my local clustering is the third. I have five friends. So, um, so, uh, so, so you have a, a, a third in that case, and then you go to everyone else and you average over everyone's local school. Right? So it's an average of a local thing. Global average of the local thing. Uh, and so, remember, I, I will use this now and then, but this is the uh, adjacency matrix. So, we're thinking of, right, you have to think about this, and it's, it's harder to deal with weighted networks. So, we're really not going to deal with that to start with. So, these are unweighted. You just, there is a friendship or not, one or zero. So, this, is, this guy here is a one if J1 and J2 are connected to each other. That's the adjacency matrix entry. <coughs> So what's the God, can, I, can I do this? It's undirected. So we have A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D. So they're not connected to themselves. We don't have that. It's symmetric, so A and B are connected to each other. Um, B and C are connected to each other. You can tell me when I do this wrong. So A and doesn't have any other friends than B. And then B is connected to C and D here, and C is also connected to D. So this is what the, this is the A matrix. Fans of linear algebra will be very excited. Calculus for you, Mike. All right, so um, this is good people. Okay, Newton, very questionable character. All right, <laughs> but Sylvester, wow. Um, Okay, so, uh, so uh, what's going on? So this is going to be, uh, we go to the neighborhood of the ith node. That's what that little thing is. We look at all their friends. So we take a pair from that neighborhood. And then we just go to the adjacency matrix and take its number. If it's a 1, they're connected, so we get a plus 1. If it's a 0, then they're not connected. So that's summing up how many, so this funny looking thing on the top is saying how many of those possible pairs are connected. And the number of possible pairs, well, it's your, the degree of node i, which we always use as k. Hopefully, I will always write as k. k sub i. So it's this, this is really k choose 2. Right? That's k choose 2. Right? How many ways are there? So you have k friends. I'm going to choose uh, k of them. Uh, two, uh, how many ways are there of choosing uh, pairs out of them? So we have. Two factorial, right? If you want to think of it like that, but it's really so it's a half k k minus one. Good, nutritious. Okay. So we're normalizing by that. So the normalization is different for each thing, right? Each little. Okay. So we just think all the people have no friends, just like the real world, or middle school. We didn't have middle school. We just had 
primary school and then high school. There was no, I, I don't know if that was good. It meant that in grade seven you were walking around with people who were seven feet tall. So it's just strange. So you can see why they built a middle school, but you know, it didn't work out. All right. Uh, okay. All right, so we do that. And then we have to average over all the nodes. So we're going to all the things. So we're going to take this blob that we had up here for each, uh, each guy, and we sum over all of them, and we divide by the number of nodes. And so that's going to be our score. So it's a little hard to see. I mean, it makes sense. It's, it's very well described, but it's perhaps a little hard to look at a network and say, this is going to be this clustering score. Fair enough. Okay. Here's a, here's, a, here's a very peculiar piece about this. It's not easy at all to build a certain clustering into a network. This turns out to be a real battle. So there's some clever work done by some people a few times in the last 10 years to do that clustering building. I, will, I don't have a slide on it, but um, so here's the, here's the problem. So imagine, so imagine we're sitting here, we have, uh, this is part of a bigger network. Something like this. So you think, all right, so I want to add more clustering to this guy, this network. I want to cluster it. Right. So this is going to go out. So you might say, let's take, so I'm going to call these things uh, triples. So one, two, three nodes, but it's open. So you might come along and say, okay, I'm going to make this more dense. And I'll add, fantastically, the color. The red is a little hot. Okay, so green. And so now we have another triangle. So that's good. So that, that there's a cluster. Right? So these, this, as far as this person's concerned, they're friends and they're more connected. However, now you've opened up all these triples here. There's this one, there's this one, right? These, these two don't know each other, but they have a friend in common. Before they had a friend of a friend of a friend. Or one less of those. Um, and then, so you've added three more triples. And you've added this one, well, this one here as well. So actually, you can act by doing what seems to be the obvious thing, adding more links like this, you in fact decrease the cluster on average. Because for the load here, that's good. Right? Eventually, you, you fill in all the links, all the possible links, and you've got a clustering of one, the thing is fully connected. So it has to go back eventually. But for a long time, in fact, you're actually making it work. Okay. Uh, so, let's see, so the clustering, so this one is zero, we, because it's just a one frame situation. This is breaking these pieces out. Um, no banks. No, this one, yeah, it's, it's not good. This uh, E is not even shown, right? It's very sad for E. So let's see, so we have this. Uh, uh, this is uh, for B, right? So B has three friends, and one of their friends, one of their pairs of friends is so there's a third, that's a little third. Uh, this one, so C has two friends, and they are connected, so their local clustering is one. And D has two friends, and they're both connected, so as far as they're concerned, their little world is complete. It's all happy, right? Okay, so, um, all right, so and that's so that's so it's seven twelfths in this case, right? You add up all of these guys and divide them by a four. Four two. Okay. Good. Totally fine. So then there's a game to think about well, what is the clustering of this network that I've just made up? You know, calculate it. I'll give you some problems to work on like that. And because we like them, these packets, because it makes us feel like real theoretical physicists. Um, okay, so this is the Newman approach. So uh, triangles and, and triples, or triples and triangles. So um, this is our example network again. So if we just take this is going to be a triangle part of it, but the triples that are sitting in here. So here's, there's only one triangle. Right? It's a closed triangle. It's a closed piece. Uh, the triples, if you can read this. So there's A, B, C. ABC, there's um, ABD, that's this pattern. And then the triangle itself actually has three triples, right? So there's this triple, there's this triple, and this one. So every triangle has three triples. Good. So that's a good thing to notice. 
Um, and so we're just going to say a triple, so if I1 and I2 and I3, they, they're, they're a triple um, around I1 if I1 is connected to I2 and I3. So I1 is the root of this, this example. So we'll say that's a kind of a triple. All right. And then it may or may not be arbitrary. This is possible. Yes? Let me just get this thing to work so I bet you it's on. Okay. Well, it's done. Okay. Yeah, okay. So let's see, so they form a triangle, of course, if this is then connected. And what this is really doing, going with the C2, the definition of it, is it's three, there's three other types. So it's three times the number of triangles divided by the number of triples. Um, so it measures the fraction of closed triples. So every triangle accounts, because every triangle has um, really, you count this triangle, uh, you count this triangle once, but in terms of triples, it's worth three. So you want to say that for this triangle, three of these triples are closed. This one is closed, this one is closed, this one is closed. So it's a fraction of closed triples. Does that make sense? Uh, okay. Because you want to think about just not the triangle, but from a vantage point in this uh, in the triangle itself. Okay, so that's the three thing. Um, transitive triples. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, so let's see. So um, we can turn this into a nice little matrix uh, problem. Little, so it's a sneaky thing to do. Uh, so, if so, we before just by definition we have that there's a connection between i and j if um, if we look at the uh, you know we're representing it by saying there's a one in the adjacency matrix. So we can say that there's this path, this triple i j l, if a i j times a j l equals one. Because it means that this guy is one and this guy is one. These are adjacency matrix entries. We're only thinking about uh, undirected, unweighted networks. So there's one times one equals one. The only possibility is if they both they both have connections, right? Otherwise it's zero. Um, we like good triples, so we want i not equal to l. So we don't want to. We have to avoid counting this. We wouldn't want to say that this is i and this is. Uh, Put the middle J, and then we're sort of we're going out here and we're coming back. That would be right. Which when we get into math world, we could count that and not be concentrated. Okay, so we'd want that to be true. And in fact, so in general, you can generalize this, right? So one path, a path, just an edge, is if the entry a i j is equal to one. A path that goes from i to l through j uh, exists if if the uh, product of the uh, Adjacency matrix entries is one, and if we want to go through this path um, from I one to say I n, and we go through I two, I three, I n minus one, um, then it exists very simply if the product of right, if we have to go through all these adjacency pieces, that should be I as well one. Um, I1, I2, I1, right, all these things. So that's going to be a 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So, so simple. But now we're kind of in matrix world. So let's see if we can understand this statement here. So the number of triples is this rather delightful little piece. Okay, so that looks like uh, an entry in A times A. If you remember your linear algebra. So let's get that guy. Let's say we have, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about, about square matrices. C equals A times B. Is it N by N? Right? And so then C, uh, I, L, this entry, is equal to the sum of A, I, J, uh, B, J, L. Which 
A equals 1 to N. So it's the dot product of the row. This is the ith row of A. And the jth row of column. Uh, jth, jth column of column. J's column, uh, yeah, yeah, column of B. So voice on voice pair, so yeah, I think so. Um, linguistic error. Okay, so we have that. Uh, so this is this little piece. So if we if we're doing A times A, right? So if, if it's just A times A, then this piece in here is going to be this is an A, so it's A I J A J O, and now we've got uh, the I L entry of A squared. So, that's exactly this piece. So if we sum over um, L equals 1 to N and I equals 1 to N, we get the total number of triples. However, we have to get rid of the ones that come back on themselves. So we're going to do that. That's the trace of A squared, because that's all the nodes that um, That means you've got I, J, J, I. Right? So you've counted those because you've gone out and back to yourself. So we get rid of the trace. The trace is the sum of the diagonal. Right? So we get rid of that. And because we've gone both ways, we've counted the triples going sometime. We've, we've counted them going this way and this way. But that's too much, so we need to divide by two. So that fixes up this piece. Right. And the number of triangles, this is quite nice as well. So it's the trace of A cubed. And there's a 6. So what's the 6? So the A cubed is a generalization of this. So now it's this story here. It's a little put on it, but I'll pick it up. Um, so now this is about going, so you, you need to have um, you need to have these guys. Let's say AIJ, AJL, and um, ALM. You want this to be equal to 1, and so then you'll have Right. So that means you have I, J, and L. And it means, in this case, you've gone from I to J, from J to L, and L back to I. That means that that was okay to do. Uh, because traces are awesome, you can also do this, right? You can just shift this guy over here. A, J, L, A, L, I, and A, I, J. So I'm just going to put this over here. So that means now we're going from JL to LI to IJ. And these things are all from um, symmetric matrices, so we can flip the order of these things, so we can go back the other way. So what we end up doing when we have A cubed is we count each triangle, we start at each node, and we go this way, we go this way, and we go this way. So there's three times, and we also go the other way. So we get six, we count each triangle six times. So we'll divide it by six. So this is so this is a you know, so, so computing this is somewhat hard. But I mean, this is trying to get it down to a, a matrix form, a linear algebra form. You need to compute an A cube, and if your matrix is you know, hundred million entries, hundred million by hundred million, this starts to get a bit bigger. It'll be a sparse matrix. So think about that. But it gives you an idea of the difficulty of calculating some of these things. All right. Happiness? That's all I've got. Um, but it is fun. So sparse networks, uh, it's true that sparse networks are just to compare these to they're not the same thing. Right? You can see one, one of them is a global average of local things. And uh, that's the what sure gets. And C2, the human one, is two global quantities divided by each other. And the number of triples, number of triangles times three divided by the number of triples. They're both global things. You can compute the number of triangles, count them up for the whole thing, count the triples for the other. All right. Wow. Okay, so um, this is this is pretty useful. It's, it's nice to compute this guy, so people often use it. And not the same. I said these words here. Okay. Good. good. Yeah. Yeah, all right, so clustering. Big deal. That is, you know, it's a, it's a reasonable measure. So in some ways, you know, I'm giving you a list of things that have been found to be important. There are more things, presumably, 
we've dug through a fair amount, but um, and of course people copy, so someone measures clustering and that seems to help, and then everyone measures clustering. I mean, it was pretty, it was pretty crazy with the small world stuff going on. People went through like Marvel superhero comics and figured out who connected to whom, and what the small world value of that thing was, or you know, was it a small world? Of course not. They went through every book you could imagine. You know, All right. Uh, so motifs. So this is a small scale piece again. So uh, this work started out of I think it's. Protein, protein, you know, gene, protein, interaction stuff. It's Uriel one. Um, Israel, very, you know, very, very nice stuff. So they're dealing with these you know, large uh, networks as well, and they're trying to find out are there small pieces of these networks that appear more often than random and have some function. So this might be like that randomizing stuff later on. And so yes, and so here's an example. So these things become hard to, to elucidate. Even when you have six or seven nodes, the number of possible ways that they can combine, you know, it's a combinatorial explosion, so you, it's, it's difficult. But for three, there aren't so many ways. And here's, here's a piece that appears a lot more in biological, these biological networks than uh, one would expect, you know, on random. So there's something being preferred about. And so they're, they're called feed forward loops. So you can see there's a little arrow here. So X, um, uh, turns on Y, turns on Z, and X also turns on Z, right? So for Z to get going, you need to have uh, Y starting up, right? So X starts to turn on. This, this starts to activate Y, which even though Z is being, uh, you know, it's feeling, it's experiencing X straight away, it has to wait for this one to turn on. So this takes a while to turn on, right? So Z takes a little while to ramp up. So it puts a little delay in that takeoff. When you switch off X, the whole thing stops straight away, though because there's this piece, this, this thing is broken. So the analogy is to a, an elevator door, right? So that you want it to close slowly, um, but wait, you want it, if you put your hand in there, you want it to abruptly um, go the other way. So it's just a useful little building block. So there's this idea right now with these big networks, but yes, we need to figure out all these little uh, building blocks. So Chris Wiggins did a lot of nice work there at uh, Columbia on this as well. Um, it's pretty messy. So Aaron Clausette done a lot of tremendous stuff and all sorts of things, looking at terrorist networks, uh, just tons of different things. This is one piece of his, one body of his work is looking at, um, so I've talked about this, so you have these huge networks, is there some structure to it on a global scale, so this is zooming out. So this is actually the NCAA football um, data set, so it's it's a bit funny because, no it's not funny, so, so uh, what's happened here, is that you know exactly who played it. Never, but you know who played whom, right? So it's not a discovery thing. So you know who played them. And you know, uh, so that's the input into the, the algorithm of these things, right? Who's linked to whom. The uh, outcome is that you see these clusterings, and, uh, and they can be rendered in you know, 2D reasonably well. And the, these are, of course, other local conferences, or whatever the right word is that people. Um, so they do pop out. Uh, and so, so that's this test. You, know, you have these known stories. We know about these conferences. There's a, a famous um, um, piece from socio sociological literature. It involves only 34 nodes. It's something like 30, 35. Uh, and it's a karate club. <coughs> so sort of a, you know, a study where someone went in and just looked at everyone and figured out who talked to whom. And there was a schism in the karate club. This is what should happen. You know? And so you, so you need your algorithm to do well with Zachary's um, karate club. That's a, that's a sort of this tiny little text. Like, does it put the, the, you know, the guys on this side on the right side and so on? Um, this is a larger thing. And then, so what you want to be able to do is go out and say, okay, um, now just give me a ton of data about gene interactions, which we have no idea about what the structure is. Right? And if it pops out something, then we start to say, well, it looks like these guys are a good team. And this, right? Okay. So, hard problem, lots of different ideas for how to do this, stuff being published in Nature and Science. It's, it's, um, so, that's my, so the term is modularity. Community detection is usually used, maybe structure detection, but modularity as well. And it's often a hierarchical structure that comes out. Right, so this, this is a, just an important thing for describing systems. And 
I may add that to this course. We'll see. It's definitely in the complex networks course. Like there are all these different techniques. Simple thing here, concurrency. Uh, so uh, we saw it with the uh, the snog map, right, from uh, from uh, some high school in the, in the Midwest. Um, obviously, it matters when your contacts are made, and so there are a lot of these uh, networks that have been uh, collapsed over time, and then you render them, and you say, oh, you know, look at this, and then, then people start to run things on top of them, right? You do your little experiment, you start to spread something on top of it, and you say, oh, this one's that, this one's that. Um, so simple models are easily, you know, you, people mess themselves up, right? These, these words are all new. Um, accumulated network data is the problem. Because you get a network, right? So if you think about uh, interactions between people, say, on Facebook, or just talking, then there are all these little pings, actually. So you actually have all these kind of little splacks going back and forth on some network. Wow. It really feels like someone's falling into the depths of hell. Right? Just... Still falling. Yeah. It's a long way down. Okay, so um, uh, there are all these little pings back and forth. If you think of so e email numbers, right? If you have all the emails sent between people that say UVM, yeah, then you just and you don't have the, maybe you don't have the content, right? So you just have A sending email to B at this timestamp. So that's really what your data is. But you could take a year and then kind of collapse it all and then make a nice looking network and it would look really cool. But, you know, maybe these people don't talk to each other anymore, they only start talking at the end of the year, right? So there's all these complications with how things could really spread. Uh, Martina and Iris really sudden, you know, made this obvious. It's, it's, it's one of these things that seems completely obvious, but it's messed up unbelievably bad. So this is something that I did a lot of work uh, with in the past. Um, PhD thesis and some other work, but, you know, I was attached to it. It goes back to the 50s, and it's kind of the earliest quantification of fractals. Basically. Didn't put a handle on it like that, like that, but uh, uh, Horton, in 1945, started to talk about we have these networks, and they kind of Clearly, there's some structure. Came up with a way of describing that <coughs> um, self similarity. And so it's a hierarchical story, which makes sense, right? So um, there are a couple of pieces in here. So you might count. So, all right, let me tell you quickly how this works. So you start with a, a base. So you have some map, and of course, now we get it from satellites. And you look at all these guys out here on the edge, these little incipient streams, and you can eventually see once we have incredible resolution now, you can see that the channel is really starting here, right? I mean, in principle, that's true. This, this is where the water actually starts, and behind that is uh, you know, it's underground flow, or it's flow that's just kind of uniform across the top, and there'll be some hill slope here and so on. So there's the start to these things. All right, so we take all these dash plots off, so we'll prune them off, and that's this next picture, and then we can iterate, we'll do it again, right? So these guys are now the smallest ones we Bring them off and we get this one. And so we go back and say the first ones we took off are order one, these guys are order two, and this one's an order three, and you can keep going. So depending on the resolution that you have, I remember having data uh, resolution for the continental US and, and various other continents at a mile resolution, and that will give you uh, Mississippi, for example, will be order 11, right? Because it's a 10 or 11 or 12. So these are exponentially growing things, these orders. So what you do is you say, okay, so now I have this huge network, take all the order threes and all the order fours and all the order fives and measure their average length. You measure how much area is actually draining into them. So for this guy, this order three, that's the basin here. Uh, this is the basin for this little guy and this little guy. Um, obviously, enormously important for right, the, this, the, the Earth's landscape is covered in these things. We're full of these, right? Because the blood networks are very similar, they're filling up the 3D space, so we'll come to this later on when we talk about the scaling of orders, but this hierarchical branching story happens over and over again when you have delivery of things, right? And so it's, it's that's what we have in organisms. Trees, of course, inherently are structured like this, uh, and they have to go from a 3D structure to a 2D one when you go to leaves. Alright, so it just turns out there's some very nice patterns here. You could add a little more, I suppose, but uh, there's this so the, the ratio as you step from order to order is roughly constant. So, the, so you can count the number of streams in an order, the area of them, the, the, the trends in the, the length of them, and as you step up through the orders, the numbers decrease in a, 
you know, um, uh, with a ratio that's constant, and then this, the lengths and areas increase with a similar rate. So these guys are all connected to each other, and then there are all these parallel size distributions, of course, right? So if you randomly choose a point on these landscapes, and then see how big the stream is, or how big, how much water drains through it, then you get a parallel uh, distribution as well. So, once again, right, all those things can be connected to each other. It's true, I did talk about it, right? I did talk about it, but, um, yes, 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 yes. But this is a more, I didn't talk about this, this is a more primitive piece, all right? So the scaling relations. Yes. Works. Okay. All right. A couple of other things that people love to measure. Uh, word distances, right? Uh, so, uh, network distance. So, we have shortest path length between two nodes. Reasonable thing to measure, right? Gives you some idea. It starts to give you some idea, really. Uh, so, it's the fewest number of steps between nodes I know. You have to do something clever to find that out, right? So, there are nice algorithms that computer scientists have built years ago and have been improved upon in all sorts of ways uh, to figure out, because in principle, you have to kind of explore the whole network. You can get from I to J, fine, and that's, that's the small world problem. That's what we'll get to. You just need to manage to get from I to J, and you'll be happy to do that. That's you know, search, a practical search problem. Um, but finding the fewest is, is the hard. So we like that. We like to measure the average shortest path length. Um, so that's this piece. That will matter for the small world story again, because that gives you a, um, as I said, some of those things. Uh, yeah, you can have weighted ones as well, right? So if there are impedances and things. Um, but this, this piece gives you a sense of the size of the network, right? So if the average shortest path length is small, then you start to think, well, it's a small world. That, that, that's a part of it, right? Because it's not so many steps between you and someone else, on average. Uh, going, and going against that, though, is can you find them, right? So that's the algorithmic part we'll come to later on. Why not easy to find them all? And so it's certainly true the, the more random the network is. Uh, network diameter, D max. And there's a, there's a paper that just about it. just had a piece, um, I think it seems to be an updated piece on the internet, which is, a, as we said, sort of a hard thing to map. It has some claim that uh, the maximum number is 19 steps, something like that. I don't know. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a um, Repackaging of all things. So it's, it's a new observation, I suppose. But uh, 19 is an enormous number. It's an enormous number, right? So 3 is a big number in social networks. That's, a, that's, a, that's the edge of our social universe. Alright, so does that piece, that's network diameter, so it's the maximum shortest path. Uh, closeness has some nice pieces here. So it's an average distance between two, any two nodes. And the, the mess that we're making here is we take one over these shortest path lengths um, and, and average over all of those and then flip, it, flip the thing back up. What that does is it handles uh, infinities, right? So if you have a disconnected network, and so the distance between two, two nodes is infinity, in principle, right? averaging that is bad, um, this is a way to handle it. It's a bit of a funny thing. Uh, but you'll see this, people use this. So it's only true that you will get this average to be infinity when everyone, all the isol nodes are isolated, they're all disconnected. Um, you're probably asking for too much. It's probably better to say, you know, there are six separate clusters, or there's one giant component, other pieces. We have a proclivity to trying to turn things into one node. All right. Okay, we'll get through this. Centrality, almost through these, these things. Um, big, big game here, right? So. You want to measure which nodes are important, and you like to rank which nodes are important, and we have an idea that, we'll come back to this later on, that you know, there's probably some node in the, in the network that can control all the other nodes, which is a terrible thinking, really, but it's something that we can't help ourselves with because we're individuals, and it's hard to understand collective group idea. So there's a great drive to do this, and of course, from a marketing perspective, fantastic, right? You want to find the one that will sell everything. Um, so this is uh, here's, uh, influential. So the first thing that you might try is just uh, your group, right? So the one with the most friends. So you can order them by the number of friends. So you should then go and try to bribe the one with the most friends. All right, this is for bribe. Okay, so um, then if you, you, you want to get a bit better at bribing, you might think, uh, let's look at something that's a little more complex. So this is just a local measurement, right? 
degree, it's just a local thing. So between this, different business. So now this is something that involves global information. So it's a fraction of shortest paths that pass through I. So again, you know, now you have to find all the shortest paths and from a computational point of view, and then figure out which ones go through I. And do that for all the nodes. Right? And you do it for edges as well, so it's an edge between us. Uh, you can find which. So if the system is such that those shortest paths are regularly being used to transmit something, you know, beams or information or hamsters, then this this between us will really mean something. But right? this is this is going to be the kind of the burden on those nodes, right? And the hamsters run across them. Um, which, from a from a, a organizational point of view, it might be that you're the person who gets all the stuff that has to be transmitted to other people. Right? So that's organization kind of well. Get rid of your telephone. Sorry. You, you guys know that. Um, okay. okay, so uh, then we get into more complicated things, right? So this is uh, Google is uh, you know, a really wrapped around this as well. You want to find, so, so from Google's point of view, you want to give someone a list of pages that are the most important relative to your search. Right? In order. Uh, and around the same time that Google came to be, so this helps and authorities out here of Carl Kleinberg, who I've mentioned before, right? So he's a person with a very loud brain and a very nice person uh, who's a grown up. Uh, uh, came up with this idea of saying, well, every node has um, maybe some degree of authority and some degree of loudness, of casticness, right? So the uh, authority is whether you know something, right? Whether you can tell, someone goes to your page and you they find out something. So Wikipedia pages are great examples. And so you can read about the topic. And then they also have a, a hardness element to them in that they'll point out to other places, right? Go to the original things or look at other Wikipedia pages. So this is a global story as well, and it's a nice algorithm where you go through it's like algebra, like SVD, for the SVD things like that. Um, you, you try to find the, uh, the uh, nodes that, that have maximum authority and hub scores. It's kind of a linear, it's a, it, is a, it is a linear thing. But the idea is that if you're a good authority, then you're pointed to by good hubs. And they're also pointed to by good hubs. And so on and so on and so on. So this helps you get away from uh, the, the one character who has a ton of groupies around them. And they're isolated by themselves. So this one would like the groupies, right? This one, this first score would say, um, Jim Jones is a, is a Jim Jones uh, uh, so, um, is, is is a champion because thousands of people are in the jungle with this person. Um, but this score would not give give that character. Okay, which is good. All right, so uh, key points for this. Thing. So right, so it's the late 1990s. So this is new, right? We would not be talking about this at all uh, 15 years ago. Just not at all. Not um, I mean, I, I went to the Santa Fe Institute Summer School um, as a, when I was a proto human um, in '96, and I think that's right. And uh, there was one thing that happened. Was really just, you know, just a good idea. It was about cascading uh, uh, immune responses. Very, very nice. But it was just like this is our little problem over here. We figured out some good stuff for it. Everything else was. So everyone's we've taken up. We had the Brian story, um, but it's really strengthened the stories we have about that we can tell and understand about complex systems. Really, you know, it's made it solid. We know. I mean, complexity is out there. We we know it's there, but this is really you know something to hold on to and for people to uh, talk across disciplines as well. Not every network is the same, of course. At all, but you're in the same frame. Uh, so they're large, sparse, natural memory. They're all sorts of things. The evolving and dynamic things that remain hard to, 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 um, to deal with, but they're there. Um, and I, I, gave, I think this is not unreasonable, but there are the clearly physical ones, there are ones that are more interactional, and ones that are abstract and don't seem to have necessarily any uh, physical impact, right? So interactional ones like the web I was talking about before, it matters that we click on Google, and Google has to build more farms with um, computers. If we use more words, if we say cat a lot, uh, okay, so the next piece to get into, and I'll, I'll, I'll start a little bit of this, but is 
I want to talk about So uh, it's models, right? So they're properties. They're, they're, it's, a, it's a bit of a hodgepodge, right? But uh, there are things that matter, and I think that you, you, we can at least at this point very much pull out degree distribution and put that at the top and say, you should look at that first. Right. Because it's sitting on top of Okay. Generalized random networks. Uh, this is the stuff that uh, helps us with the real world, which is always good. I've put small world networks here since 1998. Lots of story guys. This is the thing with 88,000 citations now. This one has about 15,000. Uh, Scarfer is here. 15,000. These three go together. Uh, there's a long story, something about balloons in there. We'll get to. Um, this I'm just adding because it's a, it's a, it's a, body, it's a large body of work. It's very good people to hold. But I'm going to throw it over the bus a little bit. So this is the so-called PSAR models. Like a little bit over the bus. Just start pushing towards the bus. Um, uh, I'm trying to think how you half for a second. So let's see. So this is not quite what we want. It's a descriptive technique. And um, the idea is you say, OK, well, so we've seen some of these things now. So you'll say, I'm going to make a, little, a black box um, which has a dot, some dials on the side. And one of those dials will be clustering. right? So we we'll want to turn the clustering and that up and down. And there might be something about degree distribution um, and so on, right? some other things. And the problem is the, it's not like uh, statistical mechanics where you say temperature is the big deal and we can go and measure the temperature through this my thermometer. Right? Um, it's that these are, uh, it's a black box and these knobs you can go from some number to some number, they don't have a way of being measured over there. So there, it's a way of creating an ensemble of networks that look like a real network that are kind of in the cloud around it, maybe that's useful, and we have other ways of doing that. Um, but it's not, this word is a tricky word, it's generative, so it helps you make networks, but it's not about how they were really made. So I push all the way into the bus. I was driving the bus. Okay, so that one is done. Alright, so I want to talk about it. Um, let me just say, I don't have an enormous amount about this, so maybe it's maybe it's more thin. Let's see. So, this is a good thing. Arbitrary degree distributions. Super duper, right? Now we can say anything you like. And this is very useful because we'll say, we'll, we'll like to do things like, here is a real world network. Let's get its degree distribution. Forget everything else. I'm going to make a whole batch of random network ones that I like. And that's you know, not a bad thing. And then we can do things like say, okay, what's the clustering in the real world, real world one compared to this batch of double um, gangers that I've made? What's the Sortativity like and what's it like over here. So if the sortativity is really high relative to what random ones are, then you can say, okay, there's something going on, so I need to look at that and to understand what's the mechanism behind that. So so the game is now, and so this this is this is uh, purely um, um, you know, it's not a physical mechanism, this is just a way of making these things uh, to give yourself an ensemble to, to play around with. So you, you actually, so you, you, what you can do is a couple of ways. You can have a real thing. You can have an artificial piece of data that you like. You love this distribution. You say, okay. Um, so you create a bunch of nodes that have degrees sampled from that distribution. Right? You do it that way. Or you can say, here's a real network. I'm going to break up all of the links. So I'm just going to cut all of the links. Snip all of them. So instead of this link here, we're going to snip it, and then we'll have stops, all these little stops. And then these guys can now be roaming around free, and we'll reconnect them with each other. And then just think about it again. So, different ways to think about it. We're going to wire them randomly, and then we can create this ensemble to test uh, how things vary from, from uh, how a real network might uh, differ from pure randomness. And we're putting the elephant in the room as the central feature that we to explain other things. So we have a soup of these guys, so we're going to start with, uh, so his, his no friends, this one has one, three, so on, and we have some, then we have some fashion, right? So there's uh, a bunch here with no friends, and then these have one, and then we have to figure out how to pull them back together. Mm -hmm. Totally exciting, right? So we're going to randomly select these stubs, so you go and get your randomly selected stub, and then you randomly select another one, and you join them up. Not nodes, that's, that's going to make a terrible uh, You have to have an even number of stubs. 
Uh, and initially, you make a bit of a mess of things because you, this guy could connect to itself. Right? You could have repeated connections between those, especially if you have um, big hubs in there. So you have to deal with that later. And so that's relatively easy to do. So here's a self connection, here's a double loop. Uh, and we're going to rewire these guys. So um, this is a, this is a okay, this is a clever idea. So we didn't we want this one to have one, two, three, four, five. So this one has degree six, and we want it to have degree six, right? This is this is a node called Jeff, and Jeff has six frames, and that has to be true. Um, and this one has five, and we have to have it on a stable five. So we can't just pick up a link and rewire it. We can't just throw that somewhere else. That's the simplest thing to do. We'll be. We've still got the same number of nodes and the same number of links. We just pick up a link and just randomly throw that down. That's going to turn us right into a Poisson degree distribution. Right, let's, do, let's do super high. Put it into the Vitamix disaster. Okay, so um, so the thing is, we so we can't do that. So we kind of have to do something where we pick up one end and rewire that. But now we've lost the degree here, uh, lost an edge, so we have to stick it on the back on the degree. So that that's that's the game. So it, this is what I'll finish with. So so this is part of the network. We've chosen these two edges. Randomly, so we randomly choose two edges. And so we have four nodes involved. You have to be careful to make sure that the I4 is not the same as I2 and so on. So we check to make sure they're different, which is you know, disjoint uh, with respect to nodes. And if we have problem ones, we can go straight to them. And then what we're going to do is rewire um, these two edges. And when you do it out of the way, we're going to swing this one down to here, and we'll swing this one up to here. So what's happened is we've, this one has been detached. This one's been attached, so this is still degree four, this is still degree three, still degree four, still degree three. So, it's fine. And so it's the same as taking the little four cycles that are on, off, on, off in the network and rotating around. So it's like spinning a little wheel everywhere and you find a little one zero zero one zero and kind of one zero one zero and then making zero one zero one. Right? Um, and then you can do this, right? So you use this over and over, you get rid of it yourself, you repeat loops, and then usually you, this is a, this is a sort of not knowledge piece about this, but if you do this roughly for 10 times the number of edges, so each edge gets 10 rewirings roughly, and sometimes you can't do it, um, then you get a pretty good randomized number. So that's a nice thing. Okay, so that's, that's a little game, and that will allow us to. Um, as well. So that's the simplest little model. The next one's going to be much more uh, about the real world. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you.